Teshin Lei, and welcome to the Awam Tibetan Buddhist Institute and our Sunday meditation hour this morning. And so for those of you watching online, if you would like a copy of the text that we use, you can go to our website at awaminstitute.org and go to the resources page and you can download the meditation practice manual there. And so we begin our practice this morning with the sound of the conch to invite all of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas to join us this morning. And then we begin with the blessing mantra. Om Sambara Sambara Bimana Sara Maha Zambaba Humpe Soha. Om Sambara Sambara Bimana Sara Maha Zambaba Humpe Soha. Om Sambara Sambara Bimana Sara Maha Zambaba Humpe Soha. Homage to Samatabhadra and Samatabhadri, because I suffer due to my own actions and I now have this precious human life without knowing when I will die, I will now engage in virtuous actions for the benefit of all sentient beings with joy and devotion. Therefore, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent in order to enable all sentient beings to attain enlightenment. I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent in order to enable all sentient beings to attain enlightenment. I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent in order to enable all sentient beings to attain enlightenment. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow, and may they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow, and may they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. And may they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. And then the Vajrasattva purification. And Vajrasattva and Vajratopa appear above me, purifying me and all beings and phenomena with nectar from the place of their union. 100 syllable mantra. Om Benza Sato Samaya Manu Palaya Benza Sato Tenopa Tishta Drido Mevawa Suto Kayo Mevawa Supo Kayo Mevawa Anu Rakto Mevawa Sarva Sedi Me Prayata Sarva Karma Sutta Me Sitim Shri Yakuru Hong Ha 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 Ho Bhagavan Sarva Tata Kata Benze Mame Mantam Benze Bawa Mahasa Samaya Sato Aum Benza Sato Samaya Anupalaya Benza Sato Tenopa Tista Drido Mebawa Sutto Kayo Mebawa Supo Kayo Mebawa Anurakto Mebawa Sarva Sedi Me Prayata Sarva Karma Sutta Me Titam Shriya Kuru Hom Ha 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 Ho Bhagavan Sarva Tata Kata Benza Mame Mantam Benze Bawa Mahasamaya Sato Benza Sato Samaya Manu Palaya Benza Sato Tenopa Tishta Drido Me Bawa Suto Kayo Me Bawa Supo Kayo Me Bawa Manu Rato Me Bawa Sarva Sidi Me Prayata Sarva Karma Sutta Me Tetem Shri Akuru Hong Ha 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 Ho Bhagavan Bhagavan Sawa Tata Kata Benze Mame Munta Benze Bawa Maha Samaya Sato Ah. Mantala offering. Om Ah Hong. 
and the Dharmakaya pure realm, Dharma died to equality, the realms of the five Sambhokakaya families self appear unobstructedly along with the array of Namanakaya pure realms that fill all of space. All this I offer as Samatabhadra's clouds of great bliss. Om Ratna Mandala Buddha Mega Samudra Saparana Samaya Aho. Whatever merit I have gathered through prostrations, offerings, confession, rejoicing, requesting, and praying for the sake of the enlightenment of all sentient beings, all this I dedicate. Home, in the northwest of the land of Oregon, in the heart of the lotus flower, endowed with the most marvelous attainments, you are renowned as a lotus born, surrounded by many hosts of dakinis. Following in your footsteps, I pray to you, come and bless me with your grace. Guru MS City Home. Home in the northwest of the land of Oregon, in the heart of a lotus flower, endowed with the most marvelous attainments, you are renowned as a lotus born, surrounded by many hosts of bikinis. Following in your footsteps, I pray to you, and bless me with your grace. Guru MS City Home. Home in the northwest of the land of Oregon, in the heart of a lotus flower, endowed with the most marvelous attainments, you are renowned as a lotus born, surrounded by many hosts of bikinis. Following in your footsteps, I pray to you, and bless me with your grace. Guru Pema City Home. And then the mantra. Om ah hum benza guru pema city hong. 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 Om ah hum benza a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh, my home is a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home that's a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home is a girl up in the city home. Oh my home 
Light radiates from the Guru's four places into my four places, purifying my body, speech, mind, and all subtle obscurations, granting the four empowerments and planting the four seeds. The Guru dissolves into light and merges inseparably into myself. So now we'll do meditation, just dissolve visualization, rest in the natural state of your awareness, if any distractions arise, thoughts, and so forth, just let them go and refocus your attention. We'll meditate for about five minutes.
Okay, for the Dharma talk that we've been working on for the last few Sundays, we're going to continue today, but just a quick review. We just did the practice, so those are the content of what we are doing as a part of that. But uh, we started out with the parts about the uh, preliminary practices on the four thoughts that turn the mind. And so that's referred to as the common nindro. And so uh, we talk about suffering, which the Buddha talked about, and particularly the idea that it's not the way we usually think of suffering in the West, but it's a much broader kind of an idea of discontent or dissatisfaction, those kind of things, although the kind of suffering we normally think of would certainly be included within that broad scope of things as well. Uh, we talked about our own actions or karma that is related to that and having this precious human life. So we have this rare opportunity. We need to take advantage of that. And we don't know when we're going to die. So that's the impermanence of all things. And so uh, that also is a stimulus for us to go ahead and do some practice right now. And then also adding in that it is for the benefit of all beings, which is a part of our practice of the Mahayana that has been incorporated into the Tibetan Buddhist practices. And so looking beyond just self-liberation, but the liberation of all sentient beings as a part of that. And then we go into the uncommon nindra, which is what we have uh, been working on. And we talked about refuge. We looked at refuge tree and all of the elements of symbolism that are included in that. And then the actual refuge prayer and prostrations that are done with the part of that. And we looked at several different, four different specific forms of refuge, the outer refuge, the inner refuge, as well as the secret and most secret forms of refuge as a part of that. So now we go on to the next part of this, which is bodhicitta. So we have the short refuge prayer, and then we have the four immeasurables as a form of reference to the uh, <clears throat> bodhicitta as a part of this. So in these four immeasurables, it's typically viewed as having two a aspects, a relative and an ultimate aspect. Um, just like when we talk about bodhicitta itself, it has a relative aspect and an ultimate aspect. So the relative aspect is, is typically referred to as uh, looking at uh, skillful means, things like loving kindness, compassion, altruism, and so forth. On the other side, the ultimate is referred to as a sense of wisdom. Uh, typically in our tradition, it would be referred to as a form of transcendent wisdom beyond conceptual uh, ideas about what that might be. So four measurables. So of course there are four of these. And so the first one is loving kindness. Loving kindness is defined in our tradition as the wish or action for all sentient beings to have happiness and its causes. And of course, the, the key word here, in terms of understanding this, is happiness. What do we mean by happiness? Happiness in, in its more extreme forms can become hedonism. You seek after pleasure, and that's one of the things the Buddha said that we should not be doing, right? any of the extreme forms like that. And so the actual verse says, may all mother sentient beings boundless as the sky have happiness and the causes of happiness. So what do we mean by all mother sentient beings? It's a fairly common phrase in the Buddhist tradition, particularly in Tibetan Buddhism. And the core idea of that is based on a principle, um, kind of a cosmology principle within Buddhism of beginningless time. Now typically in the West we think time began with the Big Bang. But of course that raises the question of what happened before the Big Bang. <laughs> and somewhat of a similar idea within Buddhism. So we believe in the idea of, yes, there are origins of universes, and universes do then eventually collapse into nothing, and then other ones are uh, manifest. And there may actually be multiverses out there right now. We don't know, but that's the cosmological view. And very consistent with the scientific view in the West as a part of that. But what does that mean then? Well, that means there isn't a beginning of time. 
there is in the context of this universe, but there's not an absolute beginning of time. And so when we look at that from a Buddhist point of view, there's this kind of an ultimate continuum of time. And we are existent in this universe that is just one of a number of universes. Um, you might even say an infinite number of universes. And another principle that is tied into this concept is the idea of reincarnation, that we can, or at least our consciousness, can be reborn into another body over and over and over again over time. And so that time is infinite. That means that we would have had potentially an infinite number of bodies at some point in our time. Now, typically, we can't recall those. Some people have experiences of, of recalling uh, what they uh, understand as having been a previous body. There are stories about the Buddha and the uh, Jataka tales about his previous, some of his previous life experiences and so forth. Um, but whether you view this literally or you view it symbolically doesn't really matter. What matters is the principle. Okay? And the principle involved here is that we should act as if it's true. And so when we look at that, we respect all beings. And we act as if we have loved, they have all loved us as our mother at some point. Now, people have loving mothers and they have not so loving mothers in their experiences. And so oftentimes the lamas will tell us, well, if you didn't have a loving experience with your mother as a role model, that it's okay to think of some other person that you've had a lo loving relationship with. And that use that as your mo role model as a part of this. And so this goes into what is called the Bodhisattva ideal. And so being a Bodhisattva, we wish the enlightenment of all sentient beings as a part of that. And because time is considered to be beginningless and we are considered to be reincarnated over endless time, then it's boundless, an infinite number of these. And the principle then is because of that, we should treat all beings as having been our loving mother. And so we want to re uh, do the same for all of them with love radiating out from our heart for all beings, if you will endless in number. So there's this common idea that all sentient beings want happiness and do not want suffering. So that's another part of what this statement is about. So the first part of that refers to loving kindness. Loving kindness is the wish that all beings want happiness. And so the second one refers to compassion. We'll talk more about compassion in a moment. But we as bodhisattvas also want them to have happiness as a part of that. So on the relative level that I was referring to, this includes anything that would help them to be happy. But there's also a word of caution to be included as a part of that. We don't want to contribute to their suffering. So we don't want to do something to make them happy that's just going to make them suffer. Okay. So that can, that can be a slippery slope, and we have to be careful because we can't always know, based on their karma and so forth, exactly what is going to make them happy and avoid some kind of a negative karmic effect as a part of that. So our actions and their actions and so forth relate to this principle of karma. And so we don't want them to, uh, we don't want to facilitate their attachment to certain things, for example, uh, to desires. We don't want to take them down the rabbit hole, um, different kinds of expressions or the hedonic treadmill, going after pleasure, where pleasures are what they really seek. And so uh, the key here, though, is our intention. And we've talked about this when we talk about karma. Uh, when the Buddha talked about karma, it wasn't just our actions, which is a literal translation of the word karma, but it's our intentional actions, our volitional actions, is what he was referring to. So the best that we can do is do our best. Okay, So we do our best without making things any worse for people. 
And so that's, that's in where the intention comes into play as a part of this. As long as our intention is to benefit them, to help them, to help them be happy in some way, at the relative level, then that's okay. And so the Buddha said to avoid the extremes. Now we don't know how far out in terms of extremes he was talking about. Is the middle really tiny and everything else is extreme? Or is the middle really quite wide and only the very extreme ends of that, what he was referring to with extremes? Now there are some indications, but that's another subject to talk about. Um, on the absolute level, so that was the relative level. On the absolute level, happiness refers to full awakening or enlightenment. And so the idea here is that we also want all beings to attain enlightenment, full awakening, uh, full realization, uh, full liberation, whichever phrase that you prefer. Um, so what is their happiness motivation? Well, one approach that we could use here is to become a role model ourselves. If we become a role model for others, that can help inspire others to also want to achieve enlightenment. So you could think of it as just be a Buddha. Okay? Now maybe we're not going to be the perfect Buddha and maybe we have our own flaws here and there. After all, this is samsara and we are sentient beings. But if we do that, if we think we are a Buddha, which fits exactly within the tantric approach to transforming everything into pure view. So we see all beings as Buddhas. All thoughts are the thoughts of a Buddha. And, and the environment in which we are is a mandala and so forth. So all of these things, if we view it in this way and we become the Buddha that is our own innate Buddha nature, then we can become a role model for others, at least to the best of our ability as a part of that. Um, in some cases, we may even provide a little bit of instruction to someone. They ask some questions about Buddhism or Buddhist practice or even just something more specific like meditation and so forth. And if they ask and they're open to us answering those kind of questions, then to the extent that we feel comfortable doing that, then we should do that. Um, and so being a role model, in my opinion, is one of the best things that we can do to help benefit other beings as a part of that. Uh, the last thing we want to do is make them resentful of our efforts, so we do have to be a little bit careful. We don't want to be pushy uh, toward other people and, and what they want, especially if they follow other religious beliefs, and that can create walls or barriers or resistance sometimes. Uh, if they're not really truly open to trying to understand our view of things. Um, there are other kinds of practices that we can do as a part of that, but again, we have a limited amount of time here to talk today, so I'm not going to try to go into those for this particular talk. <clears throat> so that's loving kindness. The second one is compassion, the wish or action for all beings not to have suffering in its causes. So one of the ways to look at those two, loving kindness and compassion, is that there's a line here. Above the line is the wish for happiness and its causes. Below the line is the wish that they don't have suffering and its causes. Okay? So that's one of the ways. They're really very closely interrelated with each other. So the verse says, may they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. And as we said, that's like discontent, dissatisfaction, and so forth. So this is like the other half of loving kindness. So in, instead of wanting them to have happiness, we don't want them to have suffering. We want them to have the good and not have the bad from a Buddhist point of view. We talked about forms of suffering earlier at the relative level, and so we want them to no longer experience ordinary everyday forms of physical suffering. So at the relative level, in terms of compassion, we're thinking about everyday ordinary kinds of suffering someone might experience. And we don't want them to do that, so we want them to have what it is that they want to have. Again, 
within the context of the Buddhist view of what kind of things might be helpful and beneficial to them as opposed to which kinds of things might actually be harmful. Um, and so, again, those kind of hedonistic desires, the, the idea that everything is about pleasure, life is about pleasure, maximizing pleasure, those are kind of things that get people in a great deal of trouble, particularly in the view of Buddhism. So uh, what we want to role model here is this altruistic intention. And maybe we will be noticed for what we do and how we do that as a part of it and affect their actions. So again, that role model at a relative level can be very helpful. At the absolute level, in terms of compassion, again, full awakening, enlightenment, is the goal we have for them as a part of this. Eliminates all forms of suffering. If we actually attain that, there are no more forms of suffering. So that's our goal for both ourselves and for them. So now, to be sure, we may still have some negative experiences, as I mentioned in the first category of loving kindness, but even the highest practitioners, people like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, for example, become ill, lose loved ones, and so forth. So they experience these kind of things, but because of the level of their understanding, their, their experience, they have minimal kinds of effects. And remember when the Dalai Lama's mother died and he said that he, he cried. Okay? And so that's okay, but he, he understood what was going on and, and so forth. So we all have those kinds of experience, um, knowing the context and the true nature of what's going on, even if we have those experiences. The third one is sympathetic joy, some just say joy. Um, in a few cases they use other terminology here, but it's a feeling of a, a peaceful kind of joy. It's not a uh, explosion of joy that uh, sometimes we refer to with that word. That all beings experience happiness or that we feel when we learn of their happiness. A kind of rejoicing is a term that some people use uh, in this context. So the verse says, may they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. So these are all, as you can see, follow kind of a similar pattern. And so this idea of rejoicing for their happiness, for others, as opposed to, for example, being jealous. Maybe they got the job that we wanted, and so they're happy about that. And so we can be happy for them about that, in spite of the fact that maybe we feel a loss at not having been able to get that job. So their happiness is at a relative level, their ordinary experiences of joy that they might have, or happiness in everyday life, and so forth. But at an absolute level, it's the happiness of liberation, the happiness of enlightenment, or full awakening, uh, or even the happiness that we achieve as we move along the path. If we view the path either as a continuum or as steps along the path, it's articulated in both of those ways in different traditions, but we move along the path and when we recognize, oh yeah, okay, I had, a, I had a really nice meditation today, that kind of thing. That also, even though it's, it's kind of a mix of relative absolute, if you will, um, those kind of things can be a part of it. So they can be small steps along the way, or of course it can be ultimate enlightenment. The fourth one is equanimity. So here it's either a sense of treating all beings equally, equanimity equal in that sense, or an experience of calm, peace, and contentment is another meaning of word, definition of the word, but especially in a difficult situation. Okay, so both of those can uh, be things that we do. When we do, uh, for example, Tong Lin, and we're looking at all beings as being equals to each other, or um, other practices associated with that. And so we view them as being the same as us in many respects. And so that's one of the views. But the other one is this idea of just calm and contentment 
that we can experience. Oftentimes in, in the process of doing um, meditation, but it can also be just in our daily lives. In fact, that's what we need to do post-meditation. The idea is when we get up off of the cushion, we continue that meditative equipoise as we go about everything else that we do. The verse says, may they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. So that one, I think, refers to this calm, this peace, this contentment. But it also says they. And so the idea is we also want them to be able to have that experience. And so either of those work at the relative level. All beings are considered as precious, just as when we talked about precious human life. They're equal in their opportunity, although perhaps not in their current circumstances. Those, um, their karmic conditions uh, or other conditions that may be beyond their own direct control uh, may affect their ability to attain awakening as a part of that. So we all have this same ability, though, as our innate inner nature, our Buddha nature. And so their challenges or difficulties regarding us or other are considered to be due to their previous experiences, their karma. And so a lama will often say, well, if somebody is experiencing these kind of negative things in their life, it's because of their previous karma. And so um, that could be things that they've done in this lifetime. They were mean to somebody, and so somebody's mean back to them, for example. We have a saying in our own culture, what goes around comes around. And a very similar kind of an idea there. Uh, but it, in, in the idea of karma and reincarnation, then it builds up over time. And so it doesn't necessarily come back in this lifetime. It may come back at a, at a future time as well. But in either case, we wish them to be free of attachment and aversion. And those are two extremes of attachment to, to one extreme of pleasures and so forth, and aversion to things like anger, hatred, and so forth. Uh, trying to be free of both of those. Um, they or others may also have a sense, uh, have seen, excuse me, may be seen as a source of our own learning as a part of that. We look around at other beings. Now, my favorite example here is Atisha's tea boy. You've heard me use that many times. So when Atisha was called to go to Tibet at around 1000 CE, he decided to take his tea boy with him. But some of his other students thought he was crazy. They couldn't believe that he would actually do that because this boy or man was considered as nothing but trouble. He was a real pain in the butt. <laughs> but how could he ever consider taking it with him? And so he responded by telling his students that the tea boy was one of his best teachers. Okay? By having this problem person around him all the time, he had to practice in a way that helped deal with that, those issues, those things going on. The challenges and the difficulties become opportunities. And so that's one of the things that not only Atisha, but many other great masters teach us is that we should look at all of the challenges going on in our life as an opportunity for practice. Okay? So in the context of equanimity, we want to consider that as another element of what we're talking about here. So we want to overcome those kind of difficulties, and we want them to overcome those kind of difficulties. So we can do what we can for them to help them. Just avoid tendencies to fight back when somebody does something or to defend ourselves. Those typically are not particularly helpful. So instead, we use this opportunity to be more like a Buddha, the role model again. Okay? So my recommendation in terms of how to actually apply the four measurables is to think about the role model as the key. It's not the only thing by any means, and you can certainly do other kinds of things, other practices and so forth, but there are so many opportunities for doing those kind of things in our daily life. And so we do what we can, and then being a role model actually becomes a part of our practice too. And when we sit on the cushion, we do our meditation, we get up off of that as, uh, 
our post-meditation practice, become the role model. Become the Buddha that you're striving to become. Now, at an absolute level, we embody those lessons and live in this sense of peace and contentment. And no matter what experiences are happening around us, it can be a real challenge, but that's the idea. The Buddha would not be affected by those. So we need to learn not to be affected by those either. When the Buddha first became awakened, he said, profound peace, natural simplicity, uncompounded luminosity. I have found the nectar-like dharma. So there's a very concise statement that I think gives us something that we can use to help follow along in our daily lives. Uh, another of my favorite quotes, this is anonymous, don't know who put this together, but peace. It does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. So that's equanimity. And then the very last part of the Four Immeasurables is little parentheses with the three X in the middle of it, and that means that we repeat things three times. So as we go through the different things, like we said with the refuge prayer, we repeat that three times. And so you'll see those sometimes in texts that indicate that we repeat that part of the text over again three times or whatever the number happens to be. The number can be different or it can be, be real general, like as many times as you can, things like that. So we find them in different ways. So that's the four immeasurables. The next thing that happens in terms of these, the third part of the uh, common nundro or uncommon nundro is Vajrasattva purification. And so this is considered to be one of the most powerful ways to purify our karma or any kind of other things that uh, we have done and uh, perhaps shouldn't have or could have avoided doing in our in our life and one of the first parts of that that is sometimes embedded into the actual text in ours it's not but uh, other times it's just inferred as being there are called the four powers and so I wanted to just mention those because we need to be aware of the four powers even if it's not actually mentioned in the text and so the first one is the power of regret. And so the power of regret is a reflection on any negative mental and physical actions that we've done or recall doing and regretting those actions, usually as a preliminary to the practice itself, but in some versions it's in, in the actual text uh, and so it becomes a part of the practice. And so the way that we implement this, if it's not in the text, is that you pause and you actually spend some time contemplating what are the things, especially in the last 24 hours, and if you do this practice every day, then hopefully you've addressed anything prior to that time, but it can go back into other things that we are aware of having done. Maybe you've had past life experiences of doing some bad things, so you can include those as well. So any of those things that we have done that are less than a Buddha might have done, we consider those and we regret having done those things, especially anything that would be considered unwholesome kinds of actions. The next one is called the power of the antidote. This is the actual practice itself, so there's not something else that we have to do other than the practice, it's just doing the practice. The third one is called the power of resolve. This is a commitment not to do those actions ever again. So once we have completed the practice, we resolve not to do those things again. And then the fourth one is called the power of reliance, or some call it the power of support. And so this is the reliance or support from the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Okay, so we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha. So as a part of our everyday support is the Buddha, the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, and the Sangha, our community, you know, whether it's our small community here or it's the broader community of all Buddhists and Buddhist practitioners or many different subgroups within that, as we've talked about before. 
So they help us in the process of fulfilling that commitment. So those four practices are very important to think about as a part of the Vajrasattva practice. So then our text says, Vajrasattva and Vajratopa appear above me, purifying me and all beings and phenomena with nectar from the place of their union. So what does that mean? Well, Vajrasattva and Vajratopa are Vajrasattva himself, the male, and his consort Vajratopa, although there are other names used sometimes for his consort, uh, are the Buddha of purification in his consort. Um, on the vase over there you can see an image of them together in union. And so we visualize them just as indicated there as together in union. And then it goes on to say they appear above me. And so they appear as if they're floating up here above our head. Sometimes they say that it's up like from your elbow on up to the tip uh, like a cubit above your head. Other times it's less specific about how high up above your head it might be. Sometimes it appears to be fairly close to your head as a part of that. So they appear above our head. You visualize them either from looking from outside of your body, looking back at them, or you can look at them as just kind of looking up through your body as if you could somehow do that. Or you just imagine that they are there. Okay. Any of those things work, but that's the part of the practice. And then purifying me and all beings. So they're not just purifying me, but all beings are embedded in as a part of that. We are a representative, if you will, of all beings, just as any particular Buddha is also a representative of all Buddhas. And so <clears throat> purifying me and all beings and phenomena, other kinds of non-beings with nectar from the place of their union. And so we visualize it and that nectar is coming down into the crown of our head and flowing through our body and then uh, throughout the body washing away or purifying all that negative karma and even any subtle tendencies that we have like habitual tendencies and so forth. All of those things are freed away from body, speech, and mind. Okay? So our body is cleansed, our speech is cleansed, and even our mind is cleansed as a part of that. So absolutely, completely cleansed, just like a Buddha would be. Again, that idea of a role model. And so that's the basic idea of doing this. Um, so the actual chant is referred to as the hundred syllable mantra. The pronunciation is a little bit different <laughs> from one context to another, just as within the United States and other places around the world, the English language is pr also pronounced differently in some cases. Now, um, here, uh, there are also various translations. I've looked at a variety of different tr ways of translating the, the text, and sometimes they're very close to each other, other times they're completely different. Uh, so this, this is one of those. So we begin with Om, which refer to the qualities of a Buddha, body, speech, and mind. And then Bhintasato is actually Vajrasapa, the way that it's pronounced often in Tibetan. And then the courageous one a, with transcendent non-dual wisdom. So this is both the relative and the absolute. And then samaya is a sacred word of uh, honor or a pledge that cannot be transgressed. And so it's a commitment. It's a vow that is taken. And so in this case, Vajrasattva made a vow to help us, to purify us. And so we're asking him to honor that commitment. And then Manupalaya, lead me along the path you took to enlightenment. So he has achieved enlightenment, he and his partner together. Or, um, you know, we asking them, you did this, so help me do that. Now, 
One of the things about this transla translation, as we got to go through this, is there's a lots of those kind of things like lead me, grant me, do this for me, do that for me, uh, which we are typically told in the teachings is not something that they do. We have to do this kind of thing. Um, so when we look through this and we listen to the way this is worded, we need to think of it kind of in reverse of that. But this is up to us to do these things. So lead me along the path you took to enlightenment. Then benza sato tenopa tishta, please help me. Similar kind of wording, abide closer to the vajra. In, in Vajra has different translations, but I like indestructible, I think, is usually best. So the Vajra Buddha mind, or indestructible Buddha mind. Nindrita means firm and stable, based on the absolute true nature of things. And then May is I, uh, Bhava or Bhava. Please grant me the ability to realize the true nature of phenomena. So we want to be able to recognize the true nature of all phenomena. And then Sutokaya Mebawa, grant me complete satisfaction as a part of that. So this is kind of a step, if you will, on the process to becoming enlightened. Supokaya Mebawa, increase the positive within me. Okay? We want to get rid of all of those negative kinds of effects and replace them with things that are positive. Anurakto Mebawa, please be in the nature of love that leads me to your state. So, Vajrasapha is a role model for us. It can lead us to that state. We just view him and his consort together in that way. Sarva Siddhi Me Prayatsa, please grant me the actual attainments, the cities, enlightenment. Sawa Karma Sutsume, please grant me all the virtuous actions as well. So here we're talking about the ability to commit virtuous kinds of actions, our own karma, doing the right thing. Sittam Sri Akuru, please give me all your glorious qualities. So as a result of all of this, the qualities of a Buddha. Hong, seed syllable signifying the Buddha Vajra mind, that indestructible mind. And then together the four ahas, ha 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 ha. The four immeasurables, there's lots of different ways. Anything that has four can be used as a, an analogy here. So the four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, rejoicing. The four empowerments, the vase empowerment, secret wisdom and word empowerment. The four joys or blisses, joy, supreme joy, special joy, innate joy. Uh, the four kayas, Nirmanakaya, Subhoka Kaya, Dharma Kaya, Subhavaka Kaya, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so all of those kind of things can be symbolized by that statement of four ha's. And then ho, ho is an exclamation of joy uh, at the accomplishment of what we have done here. Or it can be combined with, in some translations, it's combined with the four ha's. So now we have five. So we, now we have a different number that we can uh, compare with. And so in that case, for example, it could represent the wisdoms of the five Buddhas. Uh, Kshobhya, mirror-like wisdom, Ratnasambhava, equanimity, Amitabha, discriminating wisdom, Amogasiddhi, all-accomplishing wisdom, and Virachana, the Dhammadhatu, or sphere of absolute reality. So there are other fives as well, just to give you one example, one of the more common ones. And then Bhagavan, Bhagavan. Conqueror, one who has destroyed all negativity or conquered all negativity, attained all realizations or wisdom, and passed beyond the bounds of sorrow. So this is full awakening, somebody who has achieved full awakening, liberation, uh, realization, all of those kinds of expressions. And then Sarva Tathagata, all who have gone beyond, beyond samsara, uh, into the reality of emptiness as it is, so that state of the ultimate nature of things. And then benza, or vajra, 
thunderbolt, diamond, indestructible, are some of the words that are used. As I said, I like indestructible, so referring to vajra wisdom or indestructible wisdom. Mame muntai, do not abandon me, so please. You know. um, benza or vajra bhava, grant me the realization of the na vajra nature, or Buddha nature. Mahasamaya Sato, great Vajrasattva. Ah, the seed syllable of the Buddha Vajra speech. And so we started out with Om, the, representing the Buddha's mind, and we end with the Buddha's speech. And then, of course, three acts. So we do it three times. Uh, typically, customarily, we would repeat that three times as a part of that. And then we snap our fingers is also a custom uh, ring the bell as a part of that. So just real quickly, in terms of the symbolism, because this is the first time in this that we've talked about the bell and the uh, Vajra is a part of that. And so uh, first thing is that the bell handle typically has a the head or a face there. And so when you're doing it, the face should be facing you, okay? And hopefully the bells here on the tables are all facing you. And then uh, there are different ways of holding it. Um, sometimes the thumb is up at the top part here as you ring it and go back and forth. Um, and other times it's done with it down right uh, next to the bell itself and ringing it. My experience, it depends a little bit on the bell. They all seem to have their own special ways of wanting to be used, and so then we need to do that. Um, the symbolism here in general is that this represents the feminine aspect. The feminine aspect in Buddhism is wisdom, and this represents the masculine aspect. And the masculine aspect in Buddhism is the skillful means of loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, those kinds of things. Um, one other thing I just wanted to add to this is, is something that I do in my own practice as a part of this. So I mentioned that it's done typically, traditionally, three times. And so this is my dishwasher transmission to all of you, <laughs> okay? So the first time through, it's kind of like when the dishwasher goes through the first cycle and it gets rid of kind of the loose things and, the, and easy particles and so forth as a part of it. Then the second cycle, it's like the second time we go through, uh, it gets those hardened foods and other kinds of stains that are on them. And then the third time, which is we also go through, is kind of the sparkle cycle. It really makes everything sparkle that comes out after it has been completed. So it's a little bit like that. Okay, so we're going to end there today. We are out of time today. So let's just do a very brief closing prayer here uh, at the end. Um, Let's do, let's do the uh, long life prayers um, for our closing and then uh, the very end dedication. For His Holiness the Dalai Lama, for this realm encircled by snow-covered mountains, you are the source of every benefit and bliss without exception. Tenzin Gyatso, you who are one with Avalokiteshvara, may you remain steadfast until samsara's end. In His Holiness Kenshin Lama Rinpoche, in the Dharma Datu, appearing as Amitabha, in the Sambhokakaya form as Wisdom Buddha Manjushri, Bhama Sambhava's heart son Sangha Yeshe, incarnated as Bhama Dana Lingpa in previous life, and Palje Padorje in this lifetime. May your life be longer than the duration of samsara, so that all your virtuous intentions can be accomplished. Please give me your heart blessing so that my mind is united with yours in the Buddha nature, so I pray. And Yogi Kempu Dhamudawa, Emaho, you understand the noble objects of samsara, great teacher. You have realized the intent of the sacred dharma, Yogi Kempu. Your dharma practice is unification of the two. Kempu Dhamudawa, stainless moon, may you live long. 
and then the dedication. I dedicate the merit of this practice for the benefit of all sentient beings. I dedicate the merit of this practice for the benefit of all sentient beings. I dedicate the merit of this practice for the benefit of all sentient beings. So thank you very much for participating with us today. In the way of announcements, we have our schedule. And so this week at our Wednesday practice, we are going to be doing for our Dakini practice and Sok, we will be doing Yeshit Sogya. And then um, uh, the week after, we'll be doing Shakyamuni Buddha. We have five uh, Wednesdays this month. And then um, we will be continuing our class, uh, the Essential 7 class on Dzogchen this afternoon at 1 o'clock. And then, uh, let's see, a meditation hour again next week at 11 o'clock. So we may be able to wrap up the, the Dharma talk on the um, uh, preliminary practices. So please join us for that as well. So thank you all very much for coming, participating as a part of that. Please abide softly and deeply in your awareness with loving kindness and compassion for all beings, always and always. Thank you. Thank you.